Hi, everyone. Welcome to iRevel on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Meredith, and I'm here with Sarah, um, and we're going to talk about uh, this article that we read recently. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard about it. it. It was kind of a big thing. It sort of exploded onto the scene about a week ago, would you say, Sarah? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, a, it, it's an article about Facebook. There's like this Facebook scandal. Uh, so we're going to go into that a little bit, just a little bit, because that's yeah. not entirely what we're talking about. No, it just got us thinking about a subject, conspiracy theorists, um, mainly because when this study, when this information came out about Facebook's study, studying its users, it kind of made me think about how um, a lot of things coming to a lot of things are coming to light that people might have at one point dismissed as conspiracy theory, conspiracy theorists' ideas. Mm -hmm. And here we have this study with Facebook where they studied their users and they got a little bit of hot water for it. They got a little feedback, maybe right. less than positive. Um, I read the article. You've read the article. Mm -hmm. They conducted numerous studies, actually. I found today I found a list of almost 10 studies that they've conducted on their users, various wow. numbers of users. Uh, one, one, um, one of the study conductors said that probably everybody's had been part of some study on Facebook at some point. Uh, they don't always study everybody, but um, they study things from our likelihood to share items based on if our friends have shared something or purchased something and posted about it, if we'll purchase it, if we'll click on ads because our friends like the ads. Mm -hmm. um, to this last study that was the big one that got them in a lot of hot water was about uh, how people respond to positive or negative posts on Facebook basically. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'll just go into a couple of the, you know, major points on it. Um, they, it was in 2012, then in 2012, and they were trying to study a phenomenon called emotional contagion through social networks. Well, it, it's emotional contagion. They were studying it through social networks, and um, they did the study on about 700,000 people, a little less than 700,000 people, but the people, they didn't tell them before they did it, so it was without their knowledge. Um, so, uh, the, but they said it's legal because um, it's consistent with Facebook's data use policy. So it, they're saying all users agree to this policy prior to creating a Facebook account. So that's that gives informed consent. Um, and all they did, I mean, there are lots of articles about this and, and lots of people freaking out, mainly from the left, actually. The Salon articles and stuff are like, oh my goodness, how could they? Um, but <laughs> they, I know, all they did was they removed and they used, um, you know, this was mechanical, not, people weren't doing it, machines were doing it. I don't actually know how that works, but, um, you know, it's like bots were actually doing this. So they removed a variable proportion of status messages that were automatically detected as containing positive or negative emotional words. So some days they'd uh, they'd change around these particular 700,000 people. They'd change around their, or they'd just remove anything, say, positive so that the negative stuff would show up or then they'd remove the stuff that's negative so that the positive stuff would show up and they wanted to see if this would affect the mood of the person that they're studying and it did. It was a yeah. positive. Um, so reading that article both of us uh, read it and we both just pretty instantly came up with some questions. This is a bit fishy this whole story um, and I, I you know a couple of the things that I saw. One was they want to do, uh, or they're calling for regulation, of course. And anytime mm -hmm. something like this happens and they call for regulation, that's a red flag for me. Um, and and the fact that they're making such a big deal out of this, because you mentioned uh, it, the other studies that they've done, and I just don't see that anybody would be so shocked about this. People readily give up their information on Facebook. They they at least have to assume they're going to be doing marketing research. Um, 
you know, they've got all this data. And not only that, I mean, we've heard about <laughs> a ton of stuff like this all the time. So it doesn't make much sense to me that it would be such a huge scandal like it was. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was a little fishy that one of the the main um, the guy that was in charge of the study said in response to all the bad feedback about it that Facebook just cares about its users. <laughs> it wants them to feel good. Or like, okay, that is beyond fishy to me. <laughs> right. That is that's funny, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's about the lamest excuse ever. Yeah. But see, I mean to me they they want to research for their I mean their business, which is Facebook. They want to and they do advertising and all that. So they and they're constantly yeah. playing with the feed, which bothers me. But well, right. We all know that. How many times do people comment about that? Right. So why is this a big deal? I'm mm -hmm. not quite sure. And and you know, I was wondering, is the government involved in this? Because that would change the story a little bit here. Well, <laughs> according to a Cornell profile of one of the academic researchers involved in Facebook's latest study, um, the study had government funding. However, the Cornell profile has been updated, claiming there is, there has been no army funding. So, do we believe that? Yeah. I know. <laughs> Good question. Well, um, if we don't, we're conspiracy theorists, Meredith. Right, and actually, uh, all of this questioning on our part makes us conspiracy theorists. Now we're wondering mm -hmm. if this is true, why they're saying this, why they're putting this out, making a big deal out of this in the media, um, if the government's involved at all. Uh, the whole thing and, and this questioning that we're doing is sort of taboo in many yeah. circles. And they didn't release this. A whistleblower released it, right? Right. <laughs> huh. He didn't feel right about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's that's interesting. And uh, and I see a a big push a lot of times. And and you know, you can you can kind of glean this from other issues that come up too, is is a, a, not only the regulation but this sort of vilification of businesses over the government. So when business does this, oh my gosh, that's just evil. But if government does it, well they're just keeping us safe. Something like that. So, and and then you oh, yeah. see memes and articles and cartoons about how horrible big business is and how they're forcing us. I mean, one article <laughs> about this Facebook scandal was saying we're we're forced to use Facebook, and now they're forcing us without our consent into this marketing research that nobody could have foreseen. I mean, it's just kind of unbelievable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, exactly. Yeah, and so I do think it's a little suspect that the one of the areas that's calling for the regulation is academia. They want these studies to go through a vetting process uh, to protect us from things like the Milgram experiment, that was a study on obedience to authority, mm -hmm. and you know had people thinking they were shocking people to death. So it's interesting because academia, of course, they would love to have a hold of Facebook's vast user population for all kinds of studies, I imagine. Oh yeah, definitely. I, I could think of lots of people, lots of organizations that would love to have Facebook's data from all of its users, um, not least of which is the government. So, and <laughs> I mean, that, that was mentioned too, was that the government is trying to gather this information so that they can uh, cut off or, or head off any sort of revolution like the Arab Spring that gets um, you know transmitted over these social networks they want to find out how that works and how they can stop it so that is a lot more suspect than Facebook doing some marketing research to me anyway um, and I don't know if that's true it's just you know, speculation Who knows? right right exactly uh, I think is it um, the Wikipedia the Wicca WikiLeaks guy said Facebook's just a big CIA operation or something. <laughs> Do you remember reading that? That's just a, popped into my head when you said that. Yeah, slightly. I mean, I, he's critical I, of Facebook, has been for a long time, and 
Who knows? Yeah, I mean, it's a possibility. Who knows? And and this is sort of the springboard we wanted to use because all these things um, are are you know outside of the norm, and we're questioning these things. And and this is kind of what we do all the time. And this is part of critical thinking. Whenever you and I've taught my daughter, and I'm sure you've taught your children that when you're reading stuff, you know. You pull out the logical fallacies. You think critically about what you're reading. You um, compare and contrast to other things that you know, and you look up sources. All of this stuff, and um, you know what happens if you come across something that doesn't match up with the official story. Um, should you just dismiss it because you don't want to be conspiracy theorist? Should we not talk about it because that would make you kooky, um, or people will shun you? It, is that where we want to go? I mean, <laughs> for me personally, anyway, that's not. I, I'm not going to dismiss things just because it's not an official story. That's kind of. I personally, I think that's kind of ridiculous. Um, so while we were we were looking into this, and we found a f rather funny article, <laughs> and it's called. Um, it's on 21st Century Wire. I have no idea what this website is. I've never been on it before, um, but. The article is titled, New Studies, Conspiracy Theorists Sane While Government Dupes Are Crazy and Hostile. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely going to catch you. So it's, it's really, um, it says four different university studies listed below reveal a lot about the psychology of official story gatekeepers and how irrational and emotionally unstable they become when challenged with an alternative view. Now, it's not really for university studies. It's it's talking about one study, one book, and two peer-reviewed articles. So we're going to go through that just a little bit um, and talk about each one of those. Um, so the most recent study was published July 8th by psychologists Michael J. Wood and Karen M. Douglas of the University of Kent entitled, What About Building 7? A Psychological Study of Online Discussion of 9-11 Conspiracy Theories. And this study, um, and I, we looked all this stuff up, it's all sources check out. Um, so this study was basically, they're studying people's reactions, really. They're looking at um, comments and specifically about 9-11 conspiracy theory. And they're studying what people's reactions are. And um, and they made some surprising finds. Um, so it's now more conventional to leave a so-called conspiracist comment than it is conventionalist ones. Um, so people who comment on news articles, those who disbelieve government accounts of such events as 9-11 and the JFK assassination outnumber believers by more than two to one. So that means that the pro-conspiracy commenters who are expressing what is now the conventional wisdom, or the, the pro-conspiracy commenters are expressing what is now the conventional wisdom, while the anti-conspiracy commenters are becoming a small beleaguered minority. So um, that's really, really interesting. And just one more point on this one um, is that, and, and this is kind of uh, important to me because I, I always think about this. Um, so it says, let's see. Um, additionally, it turned out that the anti-conspiracy people were not only hostile, but fanatically attached to their own conspiracy theories as well. According to them, their own theory of 9-11, a conspiracy theory holding that 19 Arabs, none of whom could fly planes with any proficiency, pulled off the crime of the century under the direction of a guy on dialysis in a cave in Afghanistan, was indisputably true. The so-called conspiracists, on the other hand, did not pretend to have a theory that completely explained the events of 9-11. Uh, for people who think 9-11 was a government conspiracy, the focus is not on promoting a specific rival theory, but in trying to debunk the official account. So, um, Sarah, I just wanted to touch on that really quick, because yes. um, I don't, this is sort of, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, this is sort of, uh, I see this all the time when people are, yelling at other people for being conspiracy theorists. It, it's similar to the Marodes thing, and we as volunteerists get this all the time. Well, if you don't want to state, what's your solution? What are you going to do? What do you propose we do about the roads and about the schools and about right. police and all this? And it's not really, that's not where we're coming from. We're yeah. coming from... So 
the onus is on you because you've now said the, you, that you feel something different than what their their theory is. Mm -hmm. So now you need to tell them exactly what happened. Right. When there's, that's impossible to know. It, you really can't know that. So even, I mean, the main, and I like that this study went into that too because I've seen that in my life. It's, it's more like the conspiracy theorists will simply question the official account and the official account people will then say, you know, come back with, well, your explanation is stupid. <laughs> they didn't really have an explanation. They were just saying that they're not believing the official account. So that's a big right. thing. Um, and I'm really glad they touched on that um, in the study. And so, um, so moving on to the book, this is a new book. Um, and it just came out. So, they're amplified in the new book, Conspiracy Theory in America, by political science uh, scientist Lance DeHaven Smith. It was published earlier this year by the University of Texas Press. So he explains why people don't like being called conspiracy theorists. Um, and actually, we have a little video of that, of him mm -hmm. explaining that himself. So we're going to play that really quick. Yeah, he was on um, Abby Martin's show, Breaking the Set. On RT. Mm -hmm. In an era of rampant surveillance, government secrecy, and whistleblower crackdowns, more and more questions have arisen over the actions and intentions of the U.S. government. But regardless of how doubtful we may be of its justifications, we're taught to just accept the explanations that are given. And if we don't, if we acknowledge the gaping holes, well, that just makes us conspiracy theorists. The pejorative term that for years has been cast on those who have been bold enough to ask questions. So how did we get to a place where truth seekers are now conspiracy theorists? And what damage does it do to the pursuit of truth? We'll talk about all that and more. I'm joined by Lance DeHaven Smith, a professor of public administration at Florida State University and the author of a new book called Conspiracy Theory in America. Lance, thanks so much for joining me. So Lance, you've done a lot of research on the, on the concept of conspiracy theories, the origin of the term. Um, talk about the history of when this became a tool used to discredit legitimate questioning. It happened after the Warren Commission report was criticized for uh, the lone gunman theory and people were saying but they didn't believe that. And the CIA started a propaganda campaign, a global propaganda campaign, to label these people conspiracy theorists and to um, you know, ridicule them and say that they were just doing it to make money or they had, uh, they were in love with their own theories or they were under the, the uh, control of, of uh, communist propagandists. <laughs> okay. So he's saying that the, the, the negative connotation, the term conspiracy theorist and conspiracy theory has been around for a while, but it wasn't a negative, it didn't have a negative connotation until basically the JFK assassination. And he's saying, shockingly, it was the CIA <laughs> propaganda that, uh, similar, to, similar to the way 9-11 um, conspiracy theorists, they call them truthers, right? Or... Mm -hmm. or uh, you, you hear this word birther thrown around, um, which is a really off-putting word. But, I mean, that's what they're meant to be, is off-putting. They, they're meant to just sort of demonize this group of people. And with conspiracy theory, it's really tough because it's a blanket term covering everything. So any questions that anybody has about any, uh, you know, story that we're given in the media whatsoever is labeled a conspiracy theory, um, which is hard to, I mean, it's it was one of the most successful propaganda. Uh, yeah. One of the most successful tricks of all time um, done by right. the CIA. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, and, you know, we have examples of conspiracy theories that were found to be true. Mm-hmm. So, um, I know my own experience with it, with um, just realizing that there is information out there and there's new information coming to light every day. Uh, when I was first on the internet, I really felt like um, 
my job was to learn how to vet information because I was bombarded with new ideas that I hadn't been exposed to before and I really had this feeling like if I didn't know about it then it couldn't possibly be true. I would have learned about this, I would have heard about it, I would have learned about it in the textbooks K through 12 schooling, my parents would have told me, I would have heard about it on the news or the radio or in some conversation but finding new information about things that I thought I really understood really threw me and you know I I felt angry and I felt tricked um, and so now I and I think that's what allowed me to have an open mind and to even realize uh, that I was a voluntarist and to yeah. you know dismiss the what I've been taught about the state and you know democracy and all of those things um, and so I needed you know I just spent a lot of time you know getting over that anger um, and then just learning as much as I can. Right, and I, you know, I'll go ahead and say something super controversial here, but I would, I would say that every voluntarist and even libertarian, uh, probably, I'll just stick with voluntarist, could be labeled a conspiracy theorist um, because we're we found out the truth about the state, and lots of people call us crazy for that, but but we know it's true. So, um, and this is through research, a lot of it, and so it's kind of important that we keep our heads on straight when we're thinking about this particular topic and when we're uh, tempted to throw around names like kook and loon and, and um, you know radical fringe <laughs> crazy person whatever you want to call people who put forth conspiracy theories um, when we're doing that we just want to keep in mind that a lot of this and it has to do with cognitive dissonance is what basically what you were talking about because a lot of this mm -hmm. stuff uh, it can be painful to oh, learn it about. Was. It was. <laughs> I yeah. remember the feeling um, you know and cognitive dissonance is what explains the mental stress that we feel when our beliefs ideals or values don't match up with our with their behavior or experiences are be what we're experiencing um, People will adjust those beliefs or values in order to achieve consonants. People will actively avoid situations or information that might challenge those beliefs and values in order to avoid dissonance. I remember a specific moment when my sister presented an idea that I could not hear. And I hung up on her. And I was angry. Yeah. And I know that I've had, I know that when I've even spoken about voluntary volunteerism um, issues uh, with people that I care about, they can get angry. Mm-hmm. That was a definite... That feeling. Yeah, yeah. Painful. Mm-hmm. And that's... Um, that's what they're looking at in these studies is that's what happens and that's why um, they're saying that at this point anyway people who are holding on to the official story of things are much more angry and hostile than the people who aren't which is interesting and that's definitely a sign of cognitive dissonance that's you know classic um, which I think is all based in fear so it's you know fear of your worldview having to be completely turned upside down Fear of being ostracized for if you were to accept a new idea that's maybe not, you know, commonplace. Um, helplessness, all of those things. So, um, you know, we can keep that in mind too and be empathetic with people when they're experiencing that. Mm -hmm. um, and another point that I wanted to bring up with this and, and why it's kind of important to talk about is cognitive dissonance um, can really hinder your ability to think critically and, and clearly and that's um, what the other two sort of peer-reviewed that sort of <laughs> peer-reviewed papers that the article was talking about are about is, is how that uh, impedes cognitive function um, so those are published in the American Behavioral Scientist uh, Journal. Um, they're from 2012, uh, and, and that's basically just what they're talking about: is that the anti-conspiracy people are unable to think clearly about 
such st apparent state crimes as 9-11 due to their inability to process information that conflicts with pre-existing belief. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. And did you, you had something by Rothbard that you wanted to talk about, right? I do. I, I found this in Anatomy of the State a long time ago, and I sort of did a little cheer. I mean, I kind of cheered <laughs> through that whole essay. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very revel relevant to our uh, conversation, so I'm going to read it mm -hmm. for anybody who maybe hasn't. Um, so this is, like I said, from Anatomy of the State. It's an essay by Rothbard, and it's under the section, How the State Preserves Itself. So he says, It is important for the state to inculcate in its subjects an aversion to any conspiracy theory of history, for a search for conspiracies means a search for motives and an attribution of responsibility for historical misdeeds. If, however, any tyranny imposed by the state or venality or aggressive war was caused not by the state rulers but by mysterious and arcane social forces or by the imperfect state of the world or if in some way everyone was responsible, we are all murderers, proclaims one slogan, then there is no point to the people becoming indignant or rising up against such, mix, against such misdeeds. Furthermore, an attack on conspiracy theories means that the subjects will become more gullible in believing the general welfare reasons that are always put forth by the state for engaging in any of its despotic actions. A conspiracy theory can unsettle the system by causing the public to doubt the state's ideological propaganda. So I would say that Rothbard uh, sort of had an esteem for conspiracy theories, and mm -hmm. and in, uh, that quote to me is encouraging to look into these things and to let ideas flow freely instead of hindering them with name calling and 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 ostracizing in the way that the state wants you to, or specifically and in that's this case, almost a tactic of the state or the gatekeepers. It is would just dismiss. Mm -hmm. I mean, like what the um, the clip that we played spoke to, he was talking about that exact thing, right. demonizing the conspiracy theorists, mm -hmm. becoming a derogatory term. Um, yeah, and I have this quote that I found from F. Scott Fitzgerald from an old article in Esquire, and he said, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. Absolutely. And that was one quick point uh, that I wanted to make. We have a, a couple minutes left, so I'll make it. And um, that is that, you know, it's there are ridiculous conspiracy theories out there. I'm not going to deny that. There really are. We've all heard them, and they are ridiculous. Um, but there is nothing wrong, or, or, or it's like saying we as individuals aren't intelligent enough to tell the difference between something that's real and something that's not or we're not intelligent enough to look into it you know we we have to have somebody standing over us telling us whether or we should think one way or think another or believe one thing or believe another it's it's taking the responsibility for our own knowledge um, it, away from us as individuals and it's sort of doing that thing that the nanny state loves to do and treating adults as children and I think mm -hmm. we're all capable of critical thinking and we're all capable of doing just what F. Scott Fitzgerald says and that's holding two, uh, two beliefs in your mind at the same time without believing either one of them or you know believing right one. and and what would be so wrong about even questioning something that initially might feel really crazy to you because of course everything new that goes against everything that you believe foundationally is gonna feel like that so I think it's it needs to be something that you practice mm -hmm. I know I have I've had to you know, I, I felt myself turning away from subjects or uh, things that I've come across because I, I, don't, I don't know that, you know, I, I get that feeling again and I, I try to resist it and move towards it and investigate it and find out the other side. And sometimes it's really important just to hear the other side of something and make an informed decision. And that's what we all need to learn how to do most of anything in this age of information because ignorance is 
you know, it's there's no excuse for it anymore. You have all the information at your fingertips if you have the internet. And we need to learn to find the truth, which means we might have to investigate things that feel very, um, very icky at first, maybe, mm -hmm. or that you want to run away from. Yeah, I mean, I went through that, and I don't think that I would be here today and, and have the knowledge that I have if I wasn't willing to look at the opposing views. Uh, and that's actually, I mean, directly responsible for much of the knowledge that I have. I would have never moved beyond where I was. I would still be a liberal um, mm -hmm. if I didn't because look you at you would just be seeking out cognitive bi um, biases. Right. Yeah, I would do what lots of people do and just stick to the path that, that is well-worn and that they, they don't want to venture off of and, um, you know, get stuck in a particular thought pattern and just, you know, be there with everyone else. And I'm really happy that I didn't do that. <laughs> I'm, you know, I, I'm happy that I allowed myself to look into things that I was uncomfortable with. Um, and at this point... It's so I was just going to say, at this point, because I've been practicing this, it's not as hard. It's not. I'm. I am more open, and I, you know, I don't let things really get to me, or try not to. Anyway, um, that's like what I'm going to say. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we just wanted to leave with with a final thought. Um, I'll I'll let you take over Sarah <laughs> okay <laughs> we have we have a mutual friend Larry hi Larry if you're watching hi, Larry. and he presented that <laughs> he presented a thought that I it just really resonated with me and um, he was speaking about a particular issue but I think you could apply it to everything across the board and that's to remain agnostic and uh, about everything Mm -hmm. I, he was saying it about libertarians, and I think it's it, it's really important. Um, and in this sense, we mean voluntarists. Uh, that's kind of we use the words interchangeably, but they're not technically interchangeable. But uh, since you know that's kind of our circle of friends, <laughs> we're voluntarists. Mm -hmm. um, but he's saying it's important that we stay agnostic about these things because because the philosophy itself is agnostic about these things and so I mean you can uh, there's nothing wrong with holding personal beliefs obviously uh, but when you're when you're representing the philosophy of a volunteerism it's important to stay agnostic about things that volunteerism doesn't specifically uh, address so, and that would include all of the conspiracy theories, all of them. Yeah, and especially because we're in a status situation. So we don't really know how things would play out or what information we would have if it was really a free voluntarist society. So, you know, we do need to, we do need to try to remain agnostic about things. Absolutely. And... I, like we said earlier, if you don't plant your flag, it's not going to hurt when you have to pull it up. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So we'll leave it with that tonight and or this morning. And you can catch us every Saturday morning on the Voluntary Virtues Network from 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time where I revel, Meredith and Sarah. Thanks for tuning in. Bye, Meredith. Bye, Sarah. <laughs>